Good evening, grave robbers, and welcome back to the television graveyard. We are discussing not a TV show today, so the intro is weird. With me, as always, is TV's Noah Houlihan. I'm looking for people who won't try Wilkins coffee. We are, uh, we are covering the Imagination Unlimited exhibit today. Yes, as uh, previously shown on this very show, we love the Muppets. What? We love the Muppets. We do? We do. We really love the Muppets. So when I found out that the Jim Henson exhibit was coming to uh, Baltimore, Maryland, I packed Laura up in the car and we drove down to uh, check it out. And I was like, this is going to be some good Stay Doomed fodder. So let's talk about it. Yeah, we were we were at the Maryland Center for History and Culture. Yes. Uh, the exhibit was pretty reasonably priced. Uh, I I'm just kind of getting through some basics here. Yeah. Uh, it it was a really it's a pretty small museum. Uh, this was by far obviously the biggest draw for the museum. Oh currently. yes. By a country mile. Easily. So before we jump into this, let's pour one out. What have you got there, Noah? I have some Wilkins coffee. Uh, it's coffee with creamer with a little bit of fireball in it because of the old Wilkins uh, co- uh, Wilkins and Wilkins coffee commercial, which was one of Jim Henson's first projects, uh, where it's, it's one of my favorite bits. With this camera, I shoot pictures of people who don't drink Wilkins coffee. I'm ready. Shoot. Anybody else? This zany, very threatening coffee commercial that uh, Jim Henson created is like the precursor to the Muppets. These little 15-second spots. I have the keep it simple. Mm. Uh, Jim Henson always liked to say keep it simple. uh, Right before he suggested doing something technologically advanced and complicated. Right. So uh, this is just a sparkling water because I am still recovering from the heat exhaustion Yeah, yesterday. we spent a lot of time in the sun uh, yesterday, so we're a little, we're a little wiped. Yeah, so I was but... not interested in uh, anything alcoholic today. So it is cranberry strawberry sparkling water. Oh, that's so It's a not... little fancy. That's Miss Piggy would drink this. Yeah, there you go. So I, I'm pulling out my phone because I did keep what can... A pretty good uh, photographic diary of the event. Yes. Uh, when you walk up to the Maryland Center for Culture and History, uh, it's really, really fun because there's chalk drawings all outside. Yes. Of different Jim Henson characters. Yes. There was a great gonzo. There was uh, a slimy. There's a beautiful grover. A beautiful grover, Yes. And uh, there was also like a few uh, quotes around. I'm not sure if you saw this because I went and checked. Over in the left-hand corner, there was a quote that simply said, "I don't move the moon and stars for I, I move the moon and stars for no one." Which is from Labyrinth. Which is from Labyrinth. Yes. Uh, there was Red from Fraggles. Yes. There was Cookie Monster, and so. We get up, we check in, because uh, we had one of the first timed tickets of the day, yes. which if you go, I fully recommend going as early in the day yeah. as you can. Go early, for sure. Uh, because we had it mostly to ourselves outside of a couple other diehard fans. Yeah. Like, the other people who were there were, like, our le- they were on our level. Like, Absolutely. They were our people. And... Uh, The girl behind the desk definitely laughed at me a little bit when we walked up. Oh, you were buzzing. (laughs) I was so excited. (laughs) And when you walk in to this exhibit, it does not disappoint. No. The first thing you see before you even walk into the exhibit is this very big color your own mural about Jim Henson's legacy in Maryland. Because Jim Henson uh, lived in Maryland. He was a University of Maryland alum. Yes. So he has a lot of ties to Maryland, which is why they really were so Pushing. excited about this exam, yeah. this exhibit. And before you even walk in, there's this, and I want to 
set up that this exists because we don't really stop and get a good look at it until we're on our way out. Yeah. Uh, but it's a giant mural. Yeah, of, it's a, it looks like a color book page, and like you can color, so you can color in Jim Henson holding Kermit and some of the Maryland buildings in the background. And over time, it was going to just continue to grow. And you walk in, and the first thing you see is this absolutely beautiful wall-sized picture of a 1970s-era Jim Henson looking contemplatively at Kermit. This is a very famous picture. Yes. Uh, It's sun-dappled, it's beautiful, and in front of it is simply Kermit himself. Yes, a full Kermit the Frog waves you in as you first walk in. Yeah, like a like an authentic Muppet screen used. Yeah, and this is a big thing that you'll see throughout this uh, museum, which I loved, is all the Muppets are kept in these like clear boxes that you can also get behind. Yes. So if you were trying to fit a lot of people into a picture... You can have some people in front of Kermit, some people next to Kermit, some people behind Kermit, and everyone can get their picture with Kermit. It's very nice. Just no flash photography. Yeah, which is reasonable. It's well lit enough in there. You don't really need flash photography. So the very first picture I took is my stupid Muppet face. <laughs> and just so excited. Yeah. It's just... Uh, it's just this, and I took a one without us in it that yeah. is just this beautiful image of Kermit and Jim looking at each other as Jim waves, or as Kermit waves in front of you. So then we start to get into the history of how Jim developed what would become the Muppets. Yeah, we start at the very beginning. We start with Wilkins and Wilkins Coffee. We stop before that. Even before that, yeah. We see his business card with his home address on it. Yeah, that's so weird to see. Uh, but it, I didn't think that that was so early because it says Muppets on it, right? It's from 1959. Wow. So he always had the name Muppets. Yeah, he was already talking about the Muppets when he met Jane, the woman who'd become his wife. Right. Okay. Uh, who worked with him closely through most of his life. Something they had here that I just found absolutely crazy is... They had so many things that were handwritten by Jim. Yeah, they had all these notes that were like, that's Jim's handwriting. This is like, from not just like notes from Jim Henson, notes from a young Jim Henson. Yeah. It was very interesting to see like how his mind worked so early. And they actually had a little stand where you could put on headphones and watch old Wilkins and Wilkins commercials. They were fun. And what I really didn't know is I always knew them as Wilkins and Wilkins because of Wilkins coffee. But they didn't always sell that. They sold bread? They sold bread, they chocolate. sold chocolate, chocolate, ginger ale. I just filled my swimming pool with ginger ale. Is it Frank's? Try it. Thanks. What do you mean tasty bread is baked while you sleep? I'm awake. Like I said, tasty is baked while you sleep. I have Mash's coffee and another kind of coffee. I want the cheap stuff. Cheap, cheap, cheap. Sorry, but that other coffee's for the birds. What are you doing? I'm kneading Dugan's bread. I've never kneaded bread. Ugh. Everybody needs Dugan's bread. Uh, I have a picture of, like, the uh, storyboard that of a commercial that they made, and it's for natural, or I'm sorry, National City Bank. Yeah. So yeah, like, Wilkins and Wilkins, like, it's interesting, because this is something that's entirely lost today. Yeah. The idea of an advertising character that is not tied to a particular product. Because the only other one I can think of that, like, maybe people have heard of is Ernest. Ernest uh, P. Worrell? Yeah. Because he started as a commercial guy. Hey, Burn. Boy, I'm sure glad you switched from that uncola. Sprite's everything that stuff is. Clear, clean, caffeine-free. But Sprite tastes better, because only Sprite has limon. Know what I mean? Hey, Vern. It sure is hot up here, Vern. I bet you'd like a cold, smooth, mellow yellow right now, would you? Yeah, I just bet you would. You know, Vern, there's nothing like a good old cold, mellow yellow when you're all hot and sweaty. I think it sure beats that Mountain Dew. 
You know what that sound means in Russia, Vern? Empty. Hey, Vern, look what my brother-in-law just got down at Tyson's Toyota, Vern. A brand new Toyota Supra. A dream machine. Sexy, too, ain't it? Hey, listen, Vern, why don't you go in the house and get you on some long pants and some that musk oil, and me and you will go out and find us some action. What do you and he would just sell whatever. I, I've considered, as a weird Dark Horse episode, doing the Splash Mountain show he did. That Ernest did? Yes. I, I don't know this. It was a whole... It was very much like uh, the stunt shows of the time, where so much of the show is hyping up a stunt. Oh. It is a full 22-minute show. Like, it aired mm. a half-hour time slot. Ernest goes to Splash Mountain. Interesting. Yeah. We, we need to have a poll soon. We so really we'll throw do. that on the poll. Ernest goes to Smash Mountain. Smash Mountain. Splash Mountain. I'm a little congested, guys. So <laughs> yeah, bear he, with me. He was supposed to be the first rider of the Disneyland one. Oh, And he was the ride tester. So it was this big... They were framing it as this like big, daring stunt. Interesting. Interesting. All right. I love Ernest. Uh, so I have seen course, this. I'm, of course, for doing it. Yeah, I've seen this because I, I watched the entire thing one night. Right. Because I was like, this can't be what I think it is. Oh. Oh, it is exactly what I think it is. It's genuinely pretty mm. cute and funny. If you're a big fan of Ernest, it's a good yeah. good shout. They also had some of like the early black and white TV stuff that... Uh, Jim Henson did. And it's very interesting because there is a puppet that is clearly Kermit, but not Kermit. But was show. using the, I believe was using the name Kermit even then. Oh, really? Because mm -hmm. I, I, I don't remember it having a female voice. It was voiced by Jane at the time. Really? Yes. Interesting. Uh, Ed Sul they appeared on Ed Sullivan. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a copy of the TV Guide. Yes. And I, I, I took a picture of this TV guide. The other headline was how they chop movies for TV. And I was like, can I just, can I read that? Yeah. Like that was, this is all so interesting to me. Because I will say, it, there's one thing, oh, there's Wilkins and Wilkins, Lars showing me a picture. Yeah, they did have those puppets. I took pictures. I took pictures of everything that was not like wall. Yeah, I'll try to include as many pictures as possible in the YouTube version of this. Going back to what you were saying about copying, uh, chopping up movies, uh, there's a one moment that I always think about when it comes to that. Because you guys probably don't remember this if you're, you're younger listeners. When a movie came on television, uh, TVs were not widescreen. And you'd get a message that said, uh, this film has been adjusted to fit your screen. Yes. And like for the most part, you never really noticed. But there's always one moment that sticks out of my mind, and it's Ghostbusters 2. Okay. There's a moment where the four Ghostbusters are standing with their heads, their hands on their hips as they walk into this art gallery. And Bill Murray goes, suck in the guts, guys. We're the Ghostbusters. They all go, <gasps> on a widescreen television, all four of them fit into the shot. On a normal television, a, a was it? Four, four by three. three. Yeah. They don't. So the camera does like this weird, awkward looking pan yeah. that's not in the movie created with editing so that you can see all the Ghostbusters. Uh, so it's just very weird that like there was a time where that was a major problem always. I mean, we talked about this a couple of episodes ago with Love Actually, how I did not know about an entire subplot because I was used to seeing it on, on TV. TV. Right. Very true. So... I, I just, I found that very interesting. So we see some of their early work on like Ed Sullivan and The Tonight Show. Mm -hmm. We don't really talk about Saturday Night Live, which I was a little disappointed no, in. No, we don't see any SNL, which is very odd. I almost wonder if like SNL has the rights to all of that. Yeah. Because I would consider that a lot, like pretty... Plus there's a bunch of SNL exhibits that I'm sure that yes, stuff... Yes, which we those. attended one of those. Yeah. And really enjoyed it. Mm-hmm. So, uh, this is all, like, in the early stuff. We, they do have those puppets of Wilkins and Wilkins. And they have a little thing set up. This is one of the, few, like, two practical Our areas. Yeah, this was a lot of fun. 
And it was showing you essentially how hard it is to run a puppet. Yeah, so they gave you a choice of four puppets and a choice of three different, like, audio clips. And I thought it was very interesting because they were all weird audio clips. Like, they were not songs you would know well. Well, they were, I'm guessing because they were all public domain. Probably. Because these were all black and white 1950s things. And you tried to operate your puppet to lip sync with uh, the footage that you've chosen. Uh, Interestingly, uh, Lara, when she decided to attempt such a feat, ignored something behind her that was clearly a seat and decided (laughs) to uh, do everything on her knees. It hurt. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, I did it as well. Uh, it's, It's very difficult to match to lip sync with your hand to words you're not speaking yes uh while also gesturing correctly uh it's a lot of things to do at once especially when you don't know the song yeah you're better than me Uh, the the one I did was a duet, so it was very hard because I only had one puppet. <laughs> uh, but very cool, very interesting uh, experience there. Yeah, there were a lot of scripts, and I thought that was very, very cool. That we could kind of see all of these scripts with handwritten notes, and uh, it was so... As a production manager and a stage manager, I found it just to be so fascinating because we think everything... You think everything that's the level above you is so polished? Yeah. And seeing all the notes and all of the... Doodles. Like just random doodles and stuff like that. There was a few stations where there was like an iPad and you could actually just like thumb through the books and the scripts, which was incredible. Yeah, there's one where I am blatantly taking a picture of every page. Yeah. And I did. Uh, We also, before this, we see Rolf. Rolf was one of the first puppets outside of Kermit, Mm -hmm. and Rolf would appear in The Tonight Show. Yes. Rolf is also famously one of Jim Henson's favorites. Yeah, it's interesting. He's known for Kermit, but Rolf was like his favorite. Yeah. It's why I'm up at Christmas Carol. Rolf barely appears and is given a quick, like, he's given a very quick but obvious shot. Yeah. Where he smiles at the camera. Uh... They didn't really know what to do with Rolf without Jim. Right. So uh, it it made me very happy to see him. I love this picture. He looks so happy. He's also, it's a very proto version of Rolf. He's surprisingly cuddly looking. Well, the, we saw the original drawings of Rolf and Rolf had like this underbite and these two sharp teeth that actually stuck out. Yeah, very bulldoggy. And luckily... Jim thought better of that and got rid of them, but it was very interesting seeing early Rolf, who almost looked a little sinister. Yes. And to think that that's the character that became, like, cuddly, laid-back, grasby voice Rolf is very interesting. And then we get to this room. Yeah, this might be my favorite part. It was almost missable. Like... The way it was set up, it almost seemed like it was an employees-only area. Yes. And I stuck my head in, and it is the non-puppet, really weird Jim Henson stuff that he made. Or attempted to make, as we will see. Yes. Because there was, like, the plans for a nightclub in there. Yeah. That was so wild. Yeah. Yeah. And basically, he was like, it was these sketchings of these idea for a nightclub, and and it was like these multi dimensional screens. Like, the screens weren't flat, they were like three dimensional objects. Yeah, they were very strange looking. And we're like, yeah, and there will be projections everywhere, and like on the women who are dancing, all this other stuff. Stuff that we see today. Yeah, it was very early projection mapping. Yeah. And this is something we do very commonly see Yeah, and Jim, in, like, the Disney parks. And Jim Henson thought of it in the 60s. 
and was attempting to do it in the 60s. Yeah, unfortunately, the club uh, that... I, I think I took a picture. It's like the Sidel or something? C-Y-C-L-I-A. Cyclia. Cyclia. Cyclia was the name of the club that he wanted to make that was unfortunately never made, but is a reflection of a lot of clubs that exist today, which is very interesting. Uh, We also spent some time looking at two TV shows he made for the NBC anthology series. Anthology series of one-offs were so much more common in the 60s and 70s. Mm -hmm. And this was for an NBC one, and he did a show called Youth 68. Yes. It was a documentary about, get this, the youth in 1968. And I took pictures of it, but I also took pictures of a typewritten note complaining about the vulgarity of it. Yes, because even back then, something that continues to uh, shock people, even today in 2023, showing kids and teenagers naturally has a lot of profanity involved. It's something I always always find very interesting that teens... Uh, It reminds me of the film Bully, how teens could not go see the film Bully because it was NC-17 because of language. Because of language, yeah. But that's just how they communicate with their peers when they're not under the guise of adults. adults. It's wild to me. Mm Mm-hmm. And then another simple handwritten one uh, that says, Your experiment on television, Youth 68, was the most impressive program I've ever viewed on TV. Yeah. Both sides of the coin. It's it's interesting the idea of Jim Henson doing a documentary. Because so much of his work is surreal. Like The Cube, which he did the next year for the same NBC experiment in television series. Yes. I wish we had a show like this now. This exper- just one hour one-offs every week of the- just like... Hey, we're just going to try stuff every week. Yeah, the idea that you could tune into a show and you'd be like, I have no idea what it's going to be, is kind of a missing art form. Like, the closest I think we have to that is our, like, anthology series, like uh, Black Mirror. Love, Death, and Robots. Love, Death, and Robots is another good one. Uh, And there's still, there's, like, still a thread between all of those. But I would love if we took a bunch of people, gave them a budget, and were like, hey, go nuts. Yeah. Because I had this thought recently. Every year, there's this great little horror uh, film festival full of some of the greatest and most creative minds I've ever seen. It's called the Night Mind Candy Bowl. And yes, I'm a part of it. But still, every time I see it, I'm like, wow, this is what... The non-professionals are doing. These are like underground, like only being seen by a few people. And it's so creative and like it's always interesting to see how these people working very much contained in a box of what is possible for them yeah, are able to pull off. Imagine if we just took a handful of those creators and we're like, here is $50,000. Yeah. Make a thing. Make a 22-minute thing. They would come back with something incredible. And the fact that we lack that opportunity right now is a shame. Especially because there's never been more of a hunger for content. Mm -hmm. I'm almost wondering if we're going to see something like that coming up if the writer strike goes any longer. Of them starting to look at non-union talent. Oh, make us into scabs? Yes. Um... I doubt it. I think we'll just see more reality shows, because that's what they did last time, and the time before that. I don't know about the time before that. The time before that was the 80s, wasn't it? No, the time before that was 2000. That's when we got Survivor. There was a writer's strike going on. Yeah, so it was 2000, and then it was 2008? No, 2000 was a Screen Actors Guild strike. Oh, okay, excuse me. Which makes perfect sense. And was nearly six months. Yeah. Uh, it's interesting. I have no memory of this because I was a very, I was very young yeah. when this happened. And 
you know, another group of reruns, how would I have really noticed? I remember because it gave me that first hit of that delicious drug of reality television. Which I was too good for back then. No, and now I'm addicted to. (laughs) So, uh, so I don't know if that's going to be. Anyway, let's talk about the cube. Yes. (laughs) The cube was about a man locked in a cell and just trying to survive while people came and like visited. And they sh- they had like a small clip of it and it had this like technodrome feel where like he showed the man what a television was and like what was happening in the television was something horrible happening to him no oh. it was like it was very wild and i would love to watch this uh maybe even for an episode of stay to because while it was created for this series of like experimental, as we always say, if it does well enough, there's always room for more. It's it's easy to find. Is it? Yeah, I found it in. It's on YouTube. Next week. Yeah, it's it's very easy to find. Oh, the next thing we're going to talk about is also up. Yeah. Uh, Timepiece. It was a nine-minute short film starring Jim Henson himself. Uh, it was an experimental. It smacks of the 60s. Yes. Uh, You might know of it if you've ever seen the image of Jim Henson in a full suit with tails and top hat in some sort of winged glider. Yes. I feel like this is an image of Jim Henson that has been used a lot to be like, man, this guy is wacky. But it exists in this piece, Time Piece, which I wouldn't say is wacky because it's clearly saying something. Yes. That I wouldn't say is just for giggles. No, no. It's definitely something uh, really... It's exper- It's about a man trying to run from time. From t- Yeah, it's definitely about a man running out of time. It's very interesting because it's... To me, it's reminiscent in a way... Uh, it reminded me a little bit of Hamilton the Musical. Stay <laughs> with me. Wow, we went in totally different directions. You go first. Because Hamilton the Musical has the benefit of knowing Alexander Hamilton dies young. Mm -hmm. So setting up that running out of time, running out of time, all through Hamilton the Musical, we as an audience and Lin-Manuel Miranda as a writer knew when Alexander Hamilton would run out of time. Right. Jim Henson was playing the home game. Jim Henson has a very common theme of doing too much and being afraid of running out of time. Yeah. Yeah. And he had no way of knowing he was going to die tragically young. That's true. To me, this very much invoked feelings of run, Lola, run. Okay, we can go in opposite directions. We just went in different directions. (laughs) What's the opposite of Hamilton? Cats. Okay. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll stick by that. Uh, But it's definitely like a man running and then like shots of what he could be spending his time doing. Yes. And, like, the shots are things like him in prison breaking uh, uh, rocks. There's, like, painting going on. Him painting an elephant, which I, is a thing I'd have to think about. We only saw a small excerpt, and I don't know. We might end up doing it next week if time... If uh, What was that? Time Cube? Or if the, the Cube. The Cube uh, is not going to fill enough time for a podcast. Maybe we'll do a double feature. Uh, but... It's very interesting seeing Jim Henson do all these things where he's not using puppets. Yes. And it's vital to say this. Uh, He's not aiming at children clearly. Very clearly. I feel like a lot of people, even then, were like puppets, kids. And the Muppets and Wilkins and Wilkins are not for children. I mean, very famously, the first Muppet show was called The Muppets, Sex and Violence. Yeah. So it's even though that I know that the Muppets are not, you know, Nick Jr. content. It is interesting to see him do something without the veil of Muppets over it. And even in the few pieces, because they had they didn't show any of Youth uh, 68. Uh, but they did show a, a clip of the cube and of timepiece. 
in Timepiece, you can see some of the techniques that are used in Muppets, making Muppets work. Yes. Like, there's a moment where you see, like, Jim Henson flying. And I was like, I, I know what this is inspiring later. Uh, so it's very interesting to watch and w- with the context of who that is and it being... Yeah, knowing that it's Jim Henson. Yeah. And it seemed very purposefully tucked away. So if you were there with your kids, you could just be like, don't go in that room. And nothing in there is scary or sexual. It it would not... If you do happen to bring kids into that room, they're yeah. not going to be like scarred for life. Yeah, there's something much scarier coming up, so... We'll talk about that in a second. Oh, there's the Rolf puppet designs for the sketch. Uh, There's also, throughout, there's little, like, plaques on the wall with pictures that kind of continue to tell the story. Mm -hmm. Uh, They were going on the Today Today Show regularly in the 60s, -hmm. which led to them moving to Manhattan, and then they would later move to Connecticut. And then we hit a certain street... That we are always happy to come back to. Yes. It is Sesame Street time. We immediately turn and see Bert and Ernie. And I didn't know Ernie was Jim Henson. No? No, I did not. I don't think Ernie was always Jim Henson. Of I think he started... I mean, I think that's the thing with a lot of the early Muppets that were used in Sesame Street... Well, I mean, we did see, because Frank Oz is Bert. Yes. And they actually said, like, Jim and Frank would do their best to come back and play Bert and Ernie whenever they could, because they've really enjoyed it. And I'm not sure if you got the best experience with this. There was a Bert and Ernie section where you could put on headphones, and I think you said your headphones weren't working. Yeah, really one well. pair of headphones did not work. But it is Bert and Ernie... Not even, like, reading a script. They're just kind of talking the way two actor uh, uh, co-workers would speak. Yes. And it's interesting because you see Jim Henson and you see Frank Oz and they're like, Bert, back up a second. I'm trying to, you know, don't step on my line, Bert. Yeah. So they're in character, out of character, doing this scene. It's fascinating to watch. Uh, you know what it actually really reminds me of? And this does not appear in anything else. In mm-hmm. uh, There is a very famous set of outtakes from Emmett Otter's Jug Band Family Christmas. Yeah, you, we didn't get any Jug Band. We did not get any Emmett Otter. But yeah. it reminded me of this outtakes uh, where it's the drum rolling out of the music shop, mm-hmm. which apparently was a bit of a bear. Yeah. And took them many takes And they got a little punchy. And it was very similar to that. Yeah. Of just them kind of being like cracking jokes and trying to get through the take because they'd been at this shop for so long. Uh, The the other thing I want to say about this moment is it shows puppets being used correctly. Because a lot of people, when they imagine Muppets, they or puppets in general, they imagine a puppeteer crouch down behind some sort of barrier to hide what they're doing. Usually, when you work with puppets, everything's high. So everyone's standing up straight with their arms up high to do things. These people must have had shoulder muscles you and I could only dream of. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, But it's just interesting to me that they're showing this and they didn't have it set up that way. Uh, when we got to use the puppets, they had it set up incorrectly that we were we had to sit down, probably, so children could do it, which I understand. Yeah, <laughs> but I, mean, I just want to point that out. Yeah, it it's a really fun. And then there's Bert and Ernie. You see the count. Yes. They also had Grover. Yes, Grover was there. I love Grover. And. Uh, Jerry Nelson with Count Von Count. We do see a little bit of some of the other major players. Mostly Frank Oz, Jerry Nelson, and Richard Hunt. Yes. And it's it's a really lovely... And my favorite thing in this room is the full-size diorama 
for sl uh, Slimy Circus. Yes, a bit from Sesame Street that I had forgotten. But, like, Slimy almost in general is a character I have forgotten. But Slimy was a little orange and yellow worm that had a full circus and would do, like, stuff on the tightrope and there was, like, a worm cannonball situation. Yeah, the worm cannon is what they have the picture of. So all that just came like rushing back when I looked at this. That I was just like, oh yeah, I used to watch this all the time. Yeah, it was definitely an unlocking a memory. And then the other practical thing that you could do is here, mm -hmm. uh, where they start to introduce the anything Muppets or the whatnots. Yes. And they are Muppets that could be easily swapped out and customized. Yeah, you just throw it on your hand and do stuff. And if it needs to look angry, slap on the angry eyes. Yes. So I made Luke the emo Muppet. Yes, I thought this was very interesting. And Because like, I used the hair wrong. Yeah, you use the hair wrong in a way to create it so it's over one eye. And then you immediately go, ooh, I'm only going to use one eye. And I was like, this feels very Muppety because there was a lot of Muppets who didn't have eyes, but only like implied eyes. Boober from uh, the Fraggles, yeah. no eyes. Uh, Bunsen has glasses, but no eyes. Yeah. He has little button eyes occasionally if you see him without glasses. Without his glasses, yeah. Uh, so like the idea of, you know, taking away an eye to create the illusion of like, yeah, his eye is always buried under hair is such like a Muppet decision that I was like, this is really good. good oh, that job. makes, that makes me feel so good about myself. <laughs> Look at my little emo Muppet son. What's his name? Um, oh no, I don't know. What do you think we should call him? Uh, Luke Tipple. <laughs> there was also an art guide for uh, we start, we, there was a little section talking about the merchandising for Sesame Street mm -hmm. and how Sesame Street was the first of the Jim Henson projects to be heavily merchandised. Yes. You saw my favorite book. The monster at the end of this book. It's one of my favorite books. But you also got to see the style guide for how to draw the Muppets for mm -hmm. artists uh, because this was before you were necessarily using photos or CGI. Yeah. For anything like this. So they would have artists drawing Grover, drawing Big Bird. Mm -hmm. And then the last like 12 pages of it are what look to be like a posed calendar. And just this art is exquisite. Mm -hmm. And I took a picture of literally every single page. Uh, and it's characters you don't even see that much like Franklin. Oh, because he was the one that had that school, right? Yes. Yeah, I don't remember Franklin very clearly, just because we watched the, the lost uh, Sesame Street episode not too long ago. Uh, I just... The, the two things that really jumped out to me was the instruction to draw them with their head slightly tilted because it brings them to life. Yes, that was on the page with Ernie. It, quote, made him more appealing. Yeah, and, like, the next page is a picture of the grouch like that. And I'm like, yeah... It really does. And of course, like, Jim Henson would know how to take an inanimate object and bring it to life. Uh, and I want to invoke this, because this is another thing missing from this exhibit. Nothing about Puppet Man no. was there. But <laughs> That's for the best. It is a moment that I think about all the time, is there is a moment in the, the pilot Muppet, or Puppet Man that we covered on the show where this guy's a puppeteer he's talking to his son and he puts on an oven mitt and he grabs a salt and pepper shakers to make eyes and just makes a creature in like two seconds and it is a nothing moment but in like a magic trick his hand is wearing a glove and then it's alive yes like even though it's just subtle and he's goofing around, he does all the puppet things that make you connect with something as a living being. And it's so incredible. So the idea that you have to take that concept, something that you've learned to do, and put it into words, and seeing it there, like, tilt the head, 
is incredible to me. Uh, the other thing that got me was the magician, I, who I always forget, a la peanut butter sandwiches. What's his name? The Amazing Mumford. The Amazing Mumford. Uh, there was instructions on how to draw him, and then the instructions to how to draw the count was to draw him first. Yes. And then add the count's eyes to it. I was like, oh, yeah. <laughs> that is that is true. Just like little things like that that I never thought of that are a peek behind the curtain were great. Puppet Man, I'm, I'm thinking about it, and since Jim Henson was an executive producer, that might mm-hmm. have been why... Because he was less intimately involved with Puppet Man, and also Puppet Man was kind of a floppery. I mean, I'm going to guess the percentage of people that walked into the Jim Henson exhibit and were upset to not see Puppet Man were us. I'm going to be honest, I was... I was so happy. With, Were me. <laughs> yeah, I was, gonna say, I was so happy with what we got. I I was not that focused on what I didn't get. You didn't think about Puppet Man at all. I didn't think about Puppet Man at all. <laughs> Correct. So the next room is uh, Laura's crying room. Yes. We enter the crying room. Oh, wait. You forgot one thing. What? The face that counts. The scariest thing to you. I took a picture. Oh, God. Oh, God. Stop. Kill the fire. Look at it. No. Look at it. No. Look at it. No. I remember I, Laura. Like, I was so happy for so much of this day, and Noah's trying to steal my joy. Well, I remember before we had even gone to this, you had told me about this thing that creeped you out, that it was just like this face puppet that counted, and I didn't remember it. And then it happened to have a whole video there of it counting to 12. <laughs> and I was like, oh, I do remember this. And Laura was like, I don't, I don't like this. <laughs> I do not wish to be there. I don't want to go that way. And uh, the next room is Laura's crying room. Yes. We walk in and I immediately am like... (sighs) 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 It's the Muppet room. It's the room that is for the Muppet Show, specifically. Yeah. Again, it was a little tucked away and missable, which was weird. Yes. Um, but I was leaving, like, no stone unturned. I yeah. was, like, sniffing out spaces like a truffle dog. Mm-hmm. You did look behind Pipe and Drape at one point to make sure. Yeah. There was nothing we were missing. So well, the first thing I, we... I stuck my head in and I said, prepare yourself. Before we walked in. And I didn't. And and she didn't. And the first thing you saw was... Bunsen and Beaker. Bunsen and Beaker are fully there. And I started to cry. <laughs> <laughs> um, I immediately was like... <laughs> and then I looked to my right and there he was. My boy. Scooter. Scooter, who has become my favorite Muppet. I love Scooter, the one that makes... All of this possible. And uh, there he was. He waved at us. Uh, I took a picture with him. Uh, It was incredible just to see these Muppets, like, up close and personal. Uh, I I love Scooter. They say never meet your heroes, but, like... Yeah, meet Scooter. If your heroes are Muppets, go ahead and meet your heroes, kids. Uh, There was also this... Huge screen. Oh my god. That was playing 120 episodes of The Muppet Show at the same time. Oh, you did the math? Oh, I did the math, yeah. Oh, you weren't crying? No, I I had the brain cells to do multiplication. And uh, I cried. Lara cried. And it was interesting because Lara was like, I think it's playing every episode of The Muppets at the same time. And I was like, no, I think it's showing random clips. And then we stood there and I was like, no, they're not. They're not showing random clips. I think they are just showing the episodes. Because, like, I locked in on the Luke Skywalker episode. Because he's Luke Skywalker. He's not Mark Hamill in that episode. Correct. And I watched it for a while and I was like, no, this is just still that episode. There's (laughs) C-3PO. Yeah, because I... I saw all the one like all the ones I was looking for. I did see like yeah. the Vincent Price episode, the Alice Cooper episode, mm-hmm. the Star Wars episode, mm-hmm. George Burns, Christopher Reed, and uh, I did see my boy, 
my favorite Muppet, his only representation in this whole exhibit. But if you knew where to look, you could find Uncle Deadly. I found Uncle Deadly. Uh, and I watched some pigs in space. <laughs> and over it is, you can't really hear the audio. You can only just hear the Muppet theme. The Muppet theme song, which turned out will make me incredibly emotional. <laughs> I did take, like, a short, like, 10-second video of it. Okay. Um, just to kind of be there with it. Mm-hmm. So I could kind of sit with I took so many pictures of it. Oh, I took one more. I'm focusing on the R2-D2 episode <laughs> entirely. <laughs> and then I took one more. I'm stepping back a little bit. I didn't take horizontal video because I'm a clown. You clown. Oh, and then I took a really good up-close picture of Scooter while you were doing... While you were doing math, I think, honestly. <laughs> And then, oh, sorry, that video had sound. Um, the next thing we see is the rundown on index cards of the Carol Burnett episode. Yes. And as a production stage manager, I was like, oh, mm-hmm. oh my God. Mm-hmm. I just, I thought it was the coolest thing. So I did like stand there and like pan across it. Yeah. Uh, I think while you were doing that, I think you missed the quote that was above it. There was a Jim Henson quote that I took a picture of. Yeah. That I loved. And I was like, well, I'm going to take a picture of this because I think Lauren might have missed it. Uh, Kermit's function on the show is very much like my own in that he's trying to hold together this group of crazies, which is not unlike what I do. And that quote really hit me uh, because that's one of the reasons I identify with Scooter so much is because of my role in professional wrestling and in a way in comedy now. Yeah. Where, like, I'm not as spotlight heavy. It's about, like, making other people carry the show and me just kind of keeping everything in order. Uh, You know, the idea of, like, Jim Henson seeing something in these Muppets that he can relate to and he created them is so, like, it's such an interesting thought of just, like, yeah, I kind of, like, I see the Muppets as, like, as characters and as, like, people and, like, with thoughts and dreams. And it's good to know Jim Henson did the same, you know? I mean, I have in my home a Muppet plaque that says, I found a whole bunch of friends with the same dream. It kind of makes us, like, a family. Mm -hmm. And it's that, like kinship with the Muppets that I think is something that's really, really key in how people who have always loved the Muppets connect with it. Mm -hmm. And I just, like, that's such a good... I I love... I love Jim Henson and I love Kermit. And I'm going to... Pour one out if I cry on mic by the end of the show, guys. Yeah. So, uh, the Muppet Room had that. There was also a bit on the movies there, so they had stuff on... uh, That was like the next room, tucked away. Yeah, it was kind of connected. And it was posters for the Muppet movie, uh, The Great Muppet Caper, and uh, The Muppets Take Manhattan. Because those were the three that were released Mm -hmm. when Jim Henson was alive. Yeah. There was part of the special that I remember airing on Nickelodeon, where they were kind of giving away the Muppet magic. Yeah. And they explain how they did the bicycle scene. This is so cool. And, like, it's incredible because... Here's here's a weird story. Uh, I remember seeing this special as a child. And I I think that scene's from the Muppets Take Manhattan. I, it's from the Muppet movie. Is it from the Muppet movie where they're all on the bikes? I believe it is. Googling is taking place currently. Are we both wrong? Is it from the other one? It's not from the Great Muppet Caper. <laughs> it appears to be from Great Muppet Caper. Really? It is from the Great Muppet Caper. Oh, all right. Well, we're both wrong. Yep. We picked the one that it's not from. <laughs> I've seen all of... I, I'm kind of overdue for a rewatch of all of, of these. Of all the Muppets? I think, yeah. I'm, I'm for that as well. Yeah, I think the only one I don't need to rewatch right now is Christmas Carol... Because I do watch it every Christmas. I feel like if we started the Great Muppet rewatch right now, by the time Christmas rolled around, it would be time to watch the. (laughs) Wait, we're gonna rewatch like all of not just the movies. You want to rewatch like the whole Muppet Show and stuff too? I I mean that's that's at least a hundred and twenty (laughs) hours. 
I do, but like... I think they're half hour episodes. Okay. 60. Yeah, it's already See getting shorter. See how I do math? <laughs> See, it's already getting shorter. Uh, but anyway, the, the point of me bringing this up is I remember watching this special on Nickelodeon where they explained how they did the bicycle scene. And it was the first time that I was ever like, oh yeah, like, I knew movies weren't real, but they still have to do the things. And it was my first time being like, oh, this was probably really hard. Like, I knew Kermit was a puppet, but he's on a bicycle there, and you can see his entire body. How are they doing this? And it was so fascinating to me that I used to listen to a show on uh, WXPN okay. called Kids Corner. Okay. And they had a Muppets expert on. And you could call in and ask questions. And I called in and I got picked. And the question I asked was, how did they do the bicycles when they're on bikes? Because I just wanted to hear the answer again. Like, it was a thing I already Stop. knew. But I liked it so much that I was like, I, I want this person to also tell me. Oh. So, yeah, I called up. And they're like, then we have a call from Noah. What does Noah want to know? I want to know how... And they asked me who my favorite Muppet was, and I said, Gonzo. And When uh, you and I first started working together, we're yeah. married on in Stadium Canon, right? Like... People know we're... I think the fact that we went to Maryland together and are still together now <laughs> is kind of a good hint. I, I actually think it's when we had no production slip when COVID happened. Yeah, if you guys if you guys are shocked right now that we're married, I'm sorry to <laughs> blow your mind right now. I tend to keep my personal and professional lives as separate as possible. Mm-hmm. Um, so when you and I first started dating, I remember being like, so what's your favorite Muppet? Because that's an important question. And I asked oh, yeah. pers- uh, prospective life partners. And you did tell me Gonzo, because I guessed Fozzie and you were pretty offended. A lot of people people assume that I like Fozzie because he's a comedian, but he's a bad comedian. <laughs> like, that's not what I wanted. Uh, I also uh, remember that, like, a text about watching Muppet Christmas Carol was one of the first things that we, like, talked about. Because I was at Radio Shack and it was on. And I said, I sent you a quote from it while you were like out with your friends. Yeah. And that's the move, guys. <laughs> I love I love Muppet Christmas Carol <laughs> so much. <laughs> oh my god. It's just it's one of my all time favorite films. Oh yeah. It, um, it, it, it was great. I love how many Muppet related materials have happened on this show because they must. Uh, in any case, uh, that room that we were in also had the Muppet Babies in it. Yes, it didn't have much with the cartoon. It had a couple storyboards for the cartoon, and that was it. Yeah, but it had the puppets used at the end of Manhattan. They're yes. also used in A Muppet Family Christmas. Oh my god, I got this Jim Henson thing at the very beginning. Simple is good, not keep it simple. <laughs> simple is good. We always used to kid Jim that after telling everybody simple is good, he would turn around and try to produce the most complicated work in the world and just about wipe out all of us, him most of all, in the process. Mm-hmm. And that was hanging over. Uh, and I love those Muppet posters because I don't know if this has come out about me uh, much. I'm a huge movie poster nerd. Yeah. And uh, the person who did the Muppets... Uh, posters up through, uh, cr- up through Treasure Island mm-hmm. is Drew Struzan, mm-hmm. who is like the greatest to do it. He did Back yeah. to the Future because uh, I was talking about doing movie posters in one room of my home, and I couldn't decide which Muppet poster it would be because mm-hmm. my plan was always in November and December it was going to swap out for Christmas Carol. Yeah. But what Muppet poster was, what Drew Struzan Muppet poster was going to be the other 10 months of the year? Uh, Treasure Island. I hadn't, I never did decide. Oh. Um, I, I think at one point I was going to get all four and cycle through them whenever I felt like it. <laughs> but like the detail on these puppets, they're just, they're so, they please me greatly. Yeah, it's incredible. Uh, and. The next room is essentially kind of this catch-all of, like, here's the 80s. Yeah. 
Uh, we walked in and it was Dark Crystal, which I have to admit has never been my jam. No, I never liked Dark Crystal. And I remember being like desperate to watch it because it was like a blank spot. I think there was a time where I was doing this project called 30 Movies in 30 Days. Yes. Where I was like, I'm going to check off all the movies that like I feel like are requirements for me to watch. And one of them was Dark Crystal. And by the end of it, I was like, I don't get this. I love Jim Henson. But I don't like any of these puppets. <laughs> yeah, I did not love it. Yeah, so I did not care for it. And there was a lot there for Dark Crystal. For a thing that I was just kind of like, eh. Meh. And then you walked through a little area with Fraggles. Yes. And Fraggles, the idea behind the Fraggles was it was intended to be a show for younger children. Mm-hmm. Usually a little younger than the Muppets skewed to. That showed the world as positive and magical because Jim didn't Mm. feel like that was getting expressed enough. Yeah. Fraggle Rock is one of the first shows I ever remember watching. Yeah, same. Like, and we didn't have HBO. Yeah. So I think it was one of those, we've talked about the free weekends Mm -hmm. of premium channels. And I think uh, my father would just illegally tape them off TV for me. And I just, as, as someone who loves Fraggles, uh, like, I need to, like, figure this out. Because there was, like, five different species that existed in this world, right? Yeah. So you have the Fraggles, right? Yes. Then you have the Doozers, yes. who are these little guys that are really big into construction. They love doing, like, construction work. They love working. Then you have humans, And humans were very big compared to fraggles. Yes. So how big's a fraggle? Like the size of like a gopher? Because they were small next to the dog. They were small next to Sprocket. Fraggles are about 22 inches tall. 22 inches tall. So a little under two feet. Yes. So a doozer was small to them. Six inches. So they're six inches. Uh, Then how big are the gorgs? Because the gorgs, I think, are so big to the fraggles, but so are humans. So I was like, wait, are gorgs bigger than humans? Uh, roughly six feet. So they're roughly the same size as humans. Yes. They're just a little rounder. And then you had Mother Trash Heap. <laughs> and I'm guessing Mother Trash Heap was not as tall, but very wide, because it was a heap. Not to body shame. <laughs> Lady Trash Heap. You've called the Trash Heap so many things. Mrs. Trash Heap? No. No, I haven't. I've used the same name for Mother Trash Heap no, you this call- whole time. <laughs> what? What's the Trash Heap's real name? Lady Trash Heap? No, it's I- Marjorie! <laughs> I was just about to say The it's two Mar- most important Marjories are Marjorie the Trash Heap and Taylor Swift's grandmother. Oh, oh, excuse me, I'm sorry. How big is Marjorie? Mother Trash Heap? I hate you so much. <laughs> She's a large, matronly, sentient compost heap. <laughs> oh, there's something great about that. Uh, it doesn't seem like she's that tall next to Fraggles. Right. So it looks like she might be about two and a half feet tall, based on a Fraggle being roughly two feet tall. Okay. So one thing that I do love about this little section, and... Uh, you, you had stepped away so I'm not and I just sat and watched this as I stood next to Red the puppet for Red and Wembley yes, yes Red and Wembley uh, they have the little documentary they did on uh, Fraggle Rock and how they controlled the Doozers and basically it was this remote control puppet it was a thing you stuck your hand in and when you moved the Doozer did the same thing And they had one of those. They had the remote control thing just out in the other room. Yes. I was just like, oh, this is the thing. And maybe it's because I made Game the Gamer and I love controllers. Yes. I was just like, oh my God, this is here. So I freaked out about that more than some of the puppets I saw. (laughs) But it was incredible to see. It it just like... I would have loved to have seen a puppet of Sprocket, but I think I may have burst into tears. Yeah, I don't think the building would have survived. I'm very emotionally attached to Sprocket. Yeah. Uh, to the point where, 
this last holiday season, the Jim Henson Company did a Yule log that was just sprocket. Oh, yeah. Snoozing. It and was then, on a lot in our home. And it was occasionally like a fraggle would drop in or mm. the doozers would do something and like yeah. fix a broken Christmas light. And I just had that on a lot because it was such a, a safe thing for me. Like, it was mm-hmm. like, I just, the Muppets were such a clear part of my childhood. So was the next thing we saw. Yes, next was Labyrinth. I think I've told this on stream before about how I was banned from watching the film Labyrinth because I had done so so many times. Yes. I had driven my mother and aunt insane. Mm-hmm. And it was the two, the only two things they had from Labyrinth were the costumes from the As With The World Falls Down sequence mm-hmm. and the toys yeah. of the fiery Ludo... Uh, the figurine that inspires Jareth, mm-hmm. and one more that I, um, one more I can't think of off the top of my head, and I, I know I have a picture of it. Yeah, but the toys at the very end that were on her shelf that inspired. Yeah, like right at the end of the like the should Spo- you spoilers for Labyrinth when they say like <laughs> should you need us? Yeah, and that they're they're there mm-hmm. with her, and. Should you need us is something I've always found like to be a very important mm-hmm. thing. My whole and it was just really cool to see those. And then the last room is kind of just like things he was working on at the end of his life. Yeah. And there wasn't much there. It was mostly wall sconces. Yeah, pictures. they didn't have any of it, but like you know, Henson did the Ninja Turtles. Like for the film. Yeah, there's a great picture of him just looking at Leonardo. Yeah. Uh, A look at some of, like, the newer Muppets, which would be, like, the ones that were around the last part of his life, that, like, I remember some of them. Like, there's that really weird pale guy with the long hair. From Storyteller. That I was just like, I I have memories of this Muppet, but I have no idea what it is. Like, his his shirt was covered in, like, numbers... (laughs) I think he was part of the, the the special I was talking about where they went over, like, the magic of the Muppets. I resent that if you look up creepy white Muppet, uh, Uncle Deadly is mentioned. I'm like, he's not creepy. He's perfect. Um, I, I assume you know who I'm speaking of right now. Yeah, I, I can picture him. I have a picture. The guy in the center here. Yeah, I'm just trying to find him. It wasn't the storyteller. It was Jim Henson, the Jim Henson Hour. That's why I can't find it. Wow, uh, I'm just going to say this now, because despite the fact that I took a picture of it, I guess I never read it. Yeah. Uh, Jim Henson worked on the 1990 film The Witches based on the Ronald Dahl film. Or Ronald Dahl Roll. novel? See, Roll, Roll Dahl novel? I remember watching that as a kid and being terrified of it. I had it on tape and I could never finish it. <laughs> so it, I didn't know that was also a Henson joint. But uh, I don't know, Jim Henson knew how to scare you. Uh, there's a little bit on the storyteller, which we've seen an episode of and have considered doing for this show a few times. Yeah, I was just trying to see if I could find the name of the white character, this character on Jim Henson Hour. It's just going to drive me nuts, so we're going to take a second. I'm going to find it. Okay. That yeah. Muppet is named Digit. That's because there's numbers all over it. And okay. he is, cr- he was like a semi-robot. Yeah. He kind of was Scooter, but TV. Okay. Based on what I'm seeing here. He helped Kermit run the station for the Jim Henson Hour. All right, all right. The Jim Henson Hour, I do feel like, is a big blind spot for me. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's only 12 episodes and ran one season. Ooh. If nothing else, this thing taught us about a lot of things to cover on this show. And if the popularity of our Muppet tier list episode uh, has taught me anything, you guys want more Muppet stuff. So we're going to do more Muppet stuff soon. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. Sorry, I'm being loopy. Uh, So, 
when we walked out of the exhibit, uh, we, I made us go through twice. That's really important yeah. to mention. Yeah, we, we got to the end and we see Kermit again. I look at Laura and I go, do you want to take another lap? And she was like, yes. And now she's like, you allowed yourself to be more emotional because <laughs> you weren't in professional. We need to take pictures of this for a show that we're doing later. And this is when you got all weepy eyed. I brought... Um, it's some, it's one of the new things Disney is hawking. Uh, there's these it's like six inch stuffed animals. They have a name. I don't know what they yeah, are. Yeah, they're like the size of a doozer. They are about doozer sized. Yes. And I bought Kermit last time I was in the Disney parks. Yeah. And also the outfit I liked best was this little like rainbow. Yeah. It kind of reminds me of Epcot. Yeah. It's like a pride jumpsuit. <laughs> It's not even like a, it's not from their pride collection, I don't think, but it looks like what they had everyone wearing at the beginning of Epcot Center. Gotcha. And so I bought him a little outfit and I brought him with me. And I like, the second time we went through, I'm just clutching him. Mm -hmm. Like, because I cannot hug the Muppets. Yeah. (laughs) Oh my God. And we walk out and after we go through the second time, we really start looking at this mural. And for the most part, it is so respectful bordering on reverent. Yeah, like... There's a little bit of, like, kid crap. It is something that is, like, open for graffiti. And, like, somebody drew, like, a Transformer and stuff like that. But for the most part, it's people being very respectful. And, like, instead of just, like, coloring and drawing, they're also adding, like, in-jokes... Yes. Like, there was a place where it was clearly a billboard that you could write something. And they wrote, Mr. Hooper was here. Because other people were writing, like, so-and-so was here. Yeah. So somebody wrote, Mr. Hooper was here. And then underneath they wrote, follow that bird. And I was like, oh, this is really good. Like, there were all of these very well done little drawings. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Of all the, like, Muppets that, like didn't get enough respect in this. Like, there was a boober. There was a, uh, 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 what, oh, the crazy guy. There was Crazy Harry. Crazy Harry. There was a slimy, there was the little worm that says, hello. Yes. Did you just say hello? No, I said, hello. (laughs) Uh, Sweetums. Yes, there was no Sweetums in this whole thing. Gonzo holding on to the balloons. Mm -hmm. A few Gonzos, actually. Uh, a Statler and Waldorf saying, this exhibit's a joke. <laughs> yeah. Which, fine. Like, that's the only time I would have accepted anything against this exhibit was Statler and Waldorf doing it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this this boober art is actually just, like, very... It's really well done. Very simple, beautiful line art. Uh, there was one of those, yep, 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 uh-huh, aliens, yes. which I loved. And then, at the very top, Somebody wrote, um, I quote from the Defunct Land documentary, Kermit was alive, and so was Jim Henson. Mm-hmm. And I'm just like... <sighs> yeah, there's the Defunct Land doc- documentary uh, that he did on Jim Henson is unbelievable. It's something that like I see coming up in a lot of the other media that I watch. Yeah. Of people being like... Yo, I watched Defunct Land and cried. Uh, People who are not into theme parks the way I am into theme parks are also still watching Defunct Land. Yeah, it's it's so good. And it was so fitting to see it there in that, like, Jim Henson's legacy didn't end at his passing. No. And now, like, unintentionally, or maybe intentionally, but that defunct land uh, documentary is a vital part of the story now. It, it's how so many younger people learned about other yeah. Jim Henson work outside of the Muppets. Yeah, so many young people just wanted to learn about when they closed uh, 10,000 Leagues Under the Sea and then left YouTube continue to play and ended up learning about Jim Henson and crying. I I mean, I was there when uh, they put out the video, when he put out the video about Action Park. Yeah. I was like, ha ha. And then when he put out a series on Jim Henson a couple of summers ago, I was like, 
oh man, these are gonna, I, I love Jim Henson, this is gonna be great. I actually have warned people, like, you gotta be ready for that last yeah, episode. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. it's, it's gonna hit you emotionally. So, it's gonna hit you right, right where it hurts. And I love it, because like, I watch a lot of YouTube, and like, seeing like, cultaholic talk about it, and seeing like, the beard bros talk about it. Like, Jim Henson is just holding all of these things together it's just it's a it's a beautiful thing it's a beautiful thing i love it 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 truly is i uh because we everyone talks about like the songs they listen to when they want to uh feel something Mm -hmm. and it's always like sad emo songs i'm like if i want to cause myself pain Mm -hmm. i will listen to or worse watch the video from jim henson's memorial of just one person Mm mm-hmm and that will get me literally every time. Oh, yeah. It's, oh, it's so good. It's so good. So, yeah, that was, the exhibit was really fun. Mm-hmm. Uh, so much of this was, Laura just talks about how much she's going to cry about the Muppets for an yeah. hour. Uh, there were a few uh, Muppets that were MIA. We didn't get Sweetums. Uh, we didn't get Rizzo. No, I almost... Rizzo wasn't very big until after his passing. No, Same I always feel Pepe like... the Prong. Rizzo, Peppy, even like, I love Uncle Deadly, and he does date as far back as uh, the Muppet Show, but he didn't really become the Uncle Deadly we know and love until the Muppet Show. Yeah, or until uh, the Muppets twenty, the Muppets twenty eleven film rather. Yeah, was that that was yeah that was before the new the Muppets movie. Yes, by about five years. Yeah, because we actually talked about how uh, Walter is not in. Yeah, Walter is not there. No Boba the Bear. No Chip from IT. No, no, Boba the Bear is in Muppets 2011. I'm talking about the exhibition. Oh, okay, yes. We didn't no Chip from IT, no Walter, no Bobo. Yeah. Um, no Bean Bunny. Bean Bunny was very heavily featured in the last few projects of Jim Henson's life. Because mm-hmm. uh, the last Muppet project Jim Henson worked on was Muppet Vision 3D. Yes, and we only got, like, a photo of it. Yes, which I would have loved to have gotten a little more. I've been very vocal and very sad about uh, the loss of the Muppet store mm-hmm. that used to have, like, a lot of unique, interesting Muppets. I could go on about the, you know, homogenization of Disney gift shops for ages, but they used to have a store that had Muppet stuff. Yeah. And I have a small plush bean bunny from that era. And if I'd known they were never going to have a lot of that stuff again, I would have uh, bought whatever wasn't nailed down. Yeah. But the last time I was there, they had some pressed pennies. And uh, shout out to the cast member. I did not get their name, but a very nice cast member. I was at an after hours event yeah. in Hollywood Studios. Uh, let me in a not open area. To just take pictures of Muppet Vision. I, I don't think I knew that this happened. Yeah, I have a bunch of pictures of just an empty Muppets courtyard. Really? Yeah, because like, <laughs> this cast member is like, sure if it means that much to you, kid. <laughs> wow. Um, I was like, you can watch me the whole time. I'm just going to stand here with my cell phone and take pictures. They're like, okay. Uh, because Muppet Vision is not open during after hours events because it's a half hour show that never fills. Right. And people get really mad if they burn half an hour of a uh, hard ticket event. Yeah. In one place. Um, it's Muppet Vision is something that like I have to do every time I'm at Disney. Mm-hmm. If somebody tells me like, oh, we didn't go to Hollywood Studios. I'm like, <laughs> you missed Muppet Vision. Oh, God, I love Muppets. Mm hmm. There's a key under the mat. And there is. <laughs> Every time I'm there, I take more pictures of more details because I have this desperate fear that in the next six months, year, what have you, mm-hmm. uh, we're going to get the online thing of like, hey, so that's like the only thing between Star Tours and Galaxy's Edge. Mm-hmm. We're getting rid of it and adding more Star Wars. Yeah. And I'm going to be deeply upset if and when that happens. I love the Muppets. Um, mm-hmm. This is going to send me on like a weird Muppet vintage merchandise vendor where I start looking for like weird vintage Muppets merchandise. Oh no. <laughs> that I don't have any space for in my house. Yeah. Let's just watch something. We'll watch something after this. How about that? Okay. I'm still going to buy Muppets crap. Damn. <laughs> uh, so I guess we have to give this a verdict. Is oh, this, stay tuned. Is, is it worth going all the way to Maryland for this? 
Uh, yes, but if you happen to be in New York, this is actually an offshoot of a larger exhibit at the Museum of the Moving Image in Queens. Mm. Uh, Queens is a little bit of a hassle to get to. Yeah. Uh, I'm considering it anyway. Yeah. For this. Uh, especially as something else I was con- something else we were talking about doing may not be an option yeah. for a future Stay Doomed episode, so... Uh, I will say uh, the rest of this museum is nothing special. <laughs> no. <laughs> like, like there was like the Revolutionary War through the eyes of Maryland. And there was some interesting fashion stuff. There was a was fashion kind of thing about, uh, I want to say Claire McCandless. Yes. Who started uh, modern sportswear. And I thought that was pretty neat. Yeah. But like overall, like there was three other sections that we spent maybe 15 minutes in combined. <laughs> Yeah, and I, I passed through the diorama room because yeah. you had to to use the women's bathroom. Yeah, so if you're going, don't expect to be like, well, that's just one of the exhibits we'll go to. The other exhibits are not. I mean, if they're in if things you're interested in, yeah, maybe. if you're super into the Revolutionary War, yeah. But uh, they also didn't have like the panache of no. the hen- like. There was nothing interactive or anything like that. No, again, the Museum of Moving Images exhibit. Um, is just considerably larger. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's got 47 puppets as opposed to the roughly 10 to 15 I think we saw. Mm-hmm. It has uh, more of the like physically larger puppets, including Big Bird. Mm-hmm. And 500 artifacts that the Jim Henson family uh, donated to the Museum of the Moving Image. About 200 of them are currently on tour. Gotcha. And we saw the tour. Gotcha. Uh, I will say also, just for transparency, this is a uh, an episode that we kind of tried to do a year ago uh, when we were in D.C. and we went to the uh, Smithsonian... Uh, the Smithsonian Museum of American History. And uh, the television section was closed. The television and film section, which has R2-D2 and Kerm. It was... We just went... We went up the escalator all excited, and we, like, somehow missed all the signs saying it was closed. It just got up there and saw walls, and we're like, oh. Oh, no. I looked like that meme online. <laughs> Let me in! <laughs> and I remember me and Laura looked at each other going, well, now we have to do an episode. <laughs> Because we were away that weekend, and I was just, like, very... Uh, I, was, I, was, I was bummed out. Yeah, if you go back and look a year ago around this time, and you see, like, a very random, very short episode, that's what happened. <laughs> yeah, I uh, I do want to get back down there, because that has since reopened. It was at yeah. the Museum of American History. Yeah. Uh, and I kind of just, like, I do genuinely wish we'd been able to do it. Oh my god. Get in the car. They just opened a museum. Mirror, mirror for us all. Disney Parks and the American Narrative. Oh boy. Alright, well. Mirror, mirror on the bar. Shut up, Noah. Get in the car. Alright, well, we have to go. So, uh, it's a stay tuned from me. Thanks for asking. Uh, <laughs> oh, I didn't care. <laughs> uh, I highly recommend it. It's really great. Uh, let's say next week we do the cube. Yeah. So we'll do the cube next week, and then the week after that, we should probably do one voted by our wonderful patrons. And uh, if you want to be one of those wonderful patrons and have a chance to affect what we watch on this show, check it out, patreon.com slash plus two comedy. Where can people find us, Laura? You can email us at the Stay Doomed Show at gmail.com or on Facebook and Twitter at Stay Doomed. And uh, just tell me your favorite Muppet and reach out to me at plus two comedy on Twitter. If you just... Want to get emotional about the Muppet? Get it? Uh, I'm at Priorities. Until next time, it's time to play the music. It's time to light the lights. It's time to wait next week until the next Stay Doomed show tonight. Doom, 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 doom. Stay doomed, guys.